Well, the thing that I think that sometimes people miss is that this could only happen in America. This is a very special thing, and I think that it's sometimes taken for granted. But this is the American dream. There is nowhere else in the world this can happen. You cannot be a poor, poor woman, you know, without a college degree, and then build up a multi-million dollar empire. That can't happen. It can't happen. This can only happen in America. We're very lucky to be here. This is a story, not about horses, but a spotted cow. Not about tranquility, but tough work. Not about a president, but beer. Above all, Deborah Carey's story is the American dream. A dream come true on her own terms. A real life Cinderella story about a girl who went from literally cleaning bathrooms to a woman cleaning up in industry boardrooms. Now recognized as one of the most successful small business owners in the country, Carrie sat with First Lady Michelle Obama during her husband's 2013 State of the Union address. Carrie also served as an advisor on President Barack Obama's Champion of Change initiative. Talk about a woman in a man's world. Carrie is the president and co-owner of Wisconsin's increasingly famous and fabulous New Glarus Brewery. The beer industry is the last bastion of male chauvinism. It has taken a long time for people to have any respect for me whatsoever. And it has mostly come together of late, you know, because of the business awards. And even when I won them, somebody that I, that I partner with in a business relationship said to me, oh, you won best woman business of Wisconsin. I was like, no, I won best business person. Just over 20 years, Carrie's New Glarus Brewery has achieved a milestone. Beer will not be brewed tonight, but enjoyed by the nearly 80 employees of the company who have gathered for steaks, music, and enough fireworks to match the vast pride in their performance. They have cause to celebrate, for this tiny craft brewery has just surpassed an amazing landmark the production of one million kegs. It is in these rolling hills in the far southwestern corner of America's Dairyland that the Carries, Deb and her husband Dan, set down roots, built a home, and created their remarkable business. It is a region known for its milk, cheese, and family farms. Not to mention those hundreds and hundreds of herds of cows. The couple built their brewery on a hillside just outside the tiny village of New Glarus, Wisconsin. A community with a strong Swiss heritage. It is a great small community where people are warm and close and watch out for each other. It's been a big support for us long before she experienced the love and support of her brand new yet old world community. Deb's life as a young girl growing up in the 70s was an often sad time, plagued with family struggles, poverty, illness, and tragedy. My family didn't have much money. My dad is alcoholic. He's mentally ill. There was a lot. There's, you know, there's stories. I think I was blessed because it does make me who I am. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think that's really <laughs> that's funny. That's really funny. <laughs> it very much makes me who I am. I think you have to be grateful for every experience. It moves you forward. 
Young Deborah Dreesen actually spent her earliest years in Wisconsin, but her family moved several times before finally heading west to Colorado Springs, leaving behind her beloved home state. I did miss Wisconsin. I was really upset. I w it was toward the end of my high school. My family moved to Colorado for my dad's job, and I had huge culture shock. I talked funny, so people were always trying to get me to say boat on the bus and other things like that. And uh, it was generally pretty miserable for me. You know, it's hard to move in high school. After high school, Deb moved to Helena, Montana. She began studies at Carroll College, but had to leave when the money ran out. At the age of 23, she found herself a single mother working part-time cleaning bathrooms. Somehow, she found time to run a small graphics design company on the side. Until one day, she took on still more work in a job at a local brewery. That's where she met Dan Carey. Like most families in the 60s, we'd go on car camping vacations. We'd load up in the station wagon and start driving north, and we'd visit breweries along the way. I loved the cleanliness and the order of breweries, the red tile floors and the beautiful shiny copper kettles. I'm very much of an engineering and scientific bent, so for me it just was a natural idea to, to take to brewing a beer. In 1986, Dan and Deb were married. Soon enough, he began chasing his dream of becoming a master brewer while she began raising two children. Barely making ends meet, life was not easy for the young couple. We started out living in the trailer that Deb had bought for $5,000 and we put a picket fence around it and we cleaned it up and she had put a stove in. So we know what it's like to say, do we eat or do we buy antibiotics for our kids and and that's that's a real that's a real dilemma that people face when you have been poor and you have to decide whether the health of your children or your full stomach or keeping the heat on or the lights on these things become real through it all dan continued to pursue his education a year after they were married dan was the technical director and named valedictorian of the 1987 siebel institute course in brewing technology it's always been a magical science. It's about turning a relatively mundane agricultural product into something that's magical. People love beer. It's simple, yet it's extremely complex. People enjoy the taste of beer. Beer is about camaraderie, it's about friendship, it's a social drink. For me, Brewing a beer is an artistic expression. It's a marriage of science, engineering, and art. In 1990, Dan received his diploma from the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. Two years later, he passed his master brewer examination. His life as a beer maker extraordinaire had begun. The problem was Dan's job required him to travel a lot. He was gone a lot, and it's stressful. And he wasn't being paid very well. And um, I have my business while I'm working on weekends and long hours. So when Anheuser Bush approached him to work, we thought, wow, this is going to be great. He'll work for a nice brewery. I'll get to go pursue my art career. I'll get to stay at home and take care of the girls. And, you know, we'll finally have health insurance. But it didn't take long for Deb to realize she didn't want to be a corporate wife. It wasn't her scene, and she didn't want to move her family around the country every two years. She was also homesick and had another idea in the back of our mind. We started to feel like we're being run over by the machine. And at this point, getting kind of desperate. Like, what are we gonna do? You know, we're in our early 30s. We have kids to take care of. We can't figure out how to make a living. And, you know, and be together in a kind of normal type of lifestyle. So um, somewhere along the line, I said, you know, how about I start a brewery and you come work for me? And, I, you know, I think Dan was just like, yeah, sure, as in thinking this is never going to happen. Deb's idea to return to Wisconsin was driven by her concern for her family and her belief in her husband's ability to brew the best beer in the world. I think you should turn it so the thermometer's out here. Sure. He eats, breathes, and sleeps brewing. I, you know, he's, the guy's got yeast in his veins. But also, a certain hesitation in his heart. More realist than his wife, Dan understood the massive risk on the horizon. Eventually, he agreed to move. 
but not before another extreme emotion reared its ugly head. Fear. Scared to death. Scared to death. And I still am. I was hoping for something better. You know, um, that's the thing about being poor in America. If, you know, you don't have an education and you don't have family money. How do you get ahead? How do you get stability? And so this was the avenue that I thought seemed reasonable. And there, there's just no looking back. I had looked at the demographics for a lot of areas in America. I think I had seven of them out on the West Coast, Colorado, where we were, a couple places in Wisconsin. I thought the demographics for Madison were really good. And Dan had some frequent flyer miles left over from building breweries. And so I drew a 30 mile circumference around Madison. And I'm like, go pick a town. And I sent him in February. And he'd really not been to Wisconsin before, except once. You know, my thing is, if you like Wisconsin in February, I mean, you'll like it all the time. And so he came and he drove around and he said it's beautiful and all the towns are charming. Really what he was doing was he was tired of looking at little towns and he went to meet a brewmaster in Monroe. And he stopped in New Glarus to get gas and he said, this is really pretty. It's like Eying, where we had lived in Germany when he served his apprenticeship. And um, he knew there was a building here for sale that had a big sign on it. And this is way before the internet. And um, the thing was, he had not written down the phone number. So it was a whole adventure. And people here remember me calling, like I called the bar, called the grocery store. Could somebody go out? I will pay somebody. Just go look and get the number off this sign. She was willing to pay to get the number, but didn't need to. She would get it for free, and eventually, they purchased an abandoned warehouse on Highway 69 from local businessman Rudy Rohner in exchange for stock in their still unborn brewery. Deb traveled halfway across the country, back home to Wisconsin, by train, and with two young daughters. She began working on a business plan. The couple invested all of their savings, $40,000. Luckily, Dan found quality used brew pub equipment at a foreclosed brewery in Appleton to get the place going. In total, they will spend around $300,000 into the new venture. It took three months probably to get the equipment together. Probably the fastest brewery startup ever. Got here in June, had beer in I, September, October. And then um, I was out selling in the street and then coming back and working on the bottling line and payroll and everything manually. It was me and Dan and I think one other person. Thus, these hopeful brewmakers turned into committed, aspiring entrepreneurs. Now, they weren't merely pursuing the right barley and hops, but something so much bigger, the American dream. My feeling was, is look, we're gonna do this, and most likely we'll be out of business in three years. What's the worst that's gonna happen? The worst that's gonna happen is, is I'm gonna end up back living in a trailer, and I'm gonna be working in a gas station pumping gas. I've already lived in a trailer. I've already been poor. It doesn't bother me. I'm gonna take the chance, we'll do it. As a new brewer, Dan was inspired by the methods of the old world. But he wanted to carve out a place for his own unique style. He wanted his beer to reflect an American heritage, blended from the surrounding Wisconsin landscape. We had rented a house that didn't have insulation and the wind's blowing through at night and they can see the girl's hair blowing in the breeze. There was no kitchen to speak of. There was like a sink. We had the dishwasher jammed in the hallway to the basement. The basement was flooded. You know, we're getting up at five in the morning and working and coming back and feed the girls and get them to school and go back to work and come home and make dinner. and go back to work again and be there till midnight, one in the morning. But this is a nice thing about living in a small town. People saw that, and so somebody would send us a pizza. Somebody would drop by orange juice. People would say, I'll bring your kids back from school. I mean, they saw how hard we were working, and they knew that we didn't have money. And, you know, there's a lot of respect for that work ethic in the Midwest. When I started the brewery, I had the idea of making world-class beer. That's what I wanted to do. 
and that's what I set out to do. It's a little bit of a vain goal because, first of all, it's what is world class beer? I mean, is Budweiser a world class beer? It's the number one selling beer in the world. Or is an esoteric double IPA from your local brewery the best beer in the world? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Dan made Edelpils and Uftabach and Staghorn, and they're all really good beers. And I'm thinking, you know, Wisconsin is parochial in their buying habits. The word was out about what we were doing. We'd gotten some press. People had started to buy beer. You know, going in and out of bars and selling beer isn't exactly glamour work, but, you know, I'm happy to do it. And I'm thinking, yep, we're going to do okay. If you look at the big picture, it's insurmountable. But if you say, all I need to do today is this, then, then, you, then you have little victories. But if you keep saying, oh my gosh, I'm never going to reach whatever to make beer, um, it's, it's, uh, you, you'll just sit down and cry. They're called craft beers for a reason. They're made by craftsmen and women, artists, and their art galleries have multiplied and multiplied some more. While the craft beer industry was expanding and competition was strong, Wisconsin's little hometown brewery was surviving. Sales were steady, but slow. Nothing really hit. And then, in 1996, New Glarus Brewery's own Belgium Red a fruity, lambic-style ale was voted the best new specialty beer in the world. Dan and Deb traveled all the way to London to accept their award. We win. It's like this huge moment where all these brewers that we're in awe of, that have been around for hundreds of years, are like, who are these people? Where is Wisconsin? The Belgian brewers have been making these beers forever. They're shocked. They have these incredible laptops, which were new to us, and they're all typing madly and looking over their shoulders. And when they called our name, we didn't even get up. The people at our table all hit us, and they're like, is, isn't this you guys? Nor could they imagine the fate that awaited them as the Carries later toured the English countryside. Fate and farm animals. With all of these things in our head, we decide we'll drive a little bit north of London just to look, just to see England. There's sheep everywhere, like just everywhere. And they're adorable, and I'm talking about them, and, and uh, thinking what a tourist I sounded like. And then I thought, you know, I'll bet people come to Wisconsin from other parts of the world, and they must have the same feeling about the cows, because what's up with all these spotted cows? And I just thought that was funny, and I said, I'm going to name a beer spotted cow. And Dan's like, yeah, you know, maybe we better find somewhere to sleep. <laughs> and so, Spotted Cow became the name of a beer before there even was a beer. Upon returning home, Dad pushed Dan to begin brewing a novel beverage that he had been experimenting with. Dominated by a new strain of yeast that Dad particularly liked, the idea for the new beer came to life through a page from the past and a new chapter in their lives was launched. We'd gone to Old World, Wisconsin, and then suddenly it came to him the idea of making a farmhouse ale, like this started to gel for him. He kind of contemplates thoughts about beer and flavor for a long period of time, and it's funny to be around him because he'll come back to me and say, what do you want this to taste like? Huh. Huh. Then he just walks away, and then he'll like he might do this every day for a month. I'm like, do something with this. This could be interesting. Huh? Huh? I don't know. I don't know. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, I know. I can make a pre-prohibition beer, farmhouse ale. I got to thinking, what would a beer taste it like in the 1850s? The Pilsner style beer was becoming popular, but he they wouldn't have been able to have cooling to make ice for lagering, so they would have made it an ale, and maybe it would have been in the style of the Pilsner. It would have probably been maybe fine imported hops if they really wanted a nice flavor. It would have been made with local barleys, and it would have been unfiltered, and that's kind of where Spotted Cow came from. Using 100% natural ingredients, Dan created a beer with a unique light amber color and a slightly cloudy appearance. It was unfiltered, meaning the brewer's yeast was still in it. The results of the experiment didn't take that long, though there was some initial backlash against what traditionalists figured was a silly name, Spotted Cow became the new Glarus Brewery's signature drinking experience. It's a simple, straightforward, yet complex beer. There's a lot in that beer that's not obvious, 
There's some really expensive hops in the in that beer. It's fruity, it's sweet, it's got a certain level of haze, and that's that's not so easy to do. My wholesalers were not impressed. They didn't like it. They were trying desperately to talk me out of it. They were saying things like, come on, Deb, you think there's gonna be some like guy is gonna walk into a bar and order a spotted cow? And I was kind of like, yeah, I think they might. But I kept saying to myself, this is either gonna be a huge hit or a total flop. I mean, there's no middle ground here, but the other things weren't working. And, you know, fortunately for me, it worked. I had an old timer, uh coming into the brewery one day, and he came in and he was just angry. He wanted to know what the heck was a spotted cow. In his day, beers had names like Schlitz and Blatz and Bush. And uh, what were you thinking when you named a beer spotted cow? And I kind of looked at him and I said, oh, well, people drink it. And besides, tell me what a Budweiser is. I mean, you know, come on. So, uh, of course, that conversation didn't go well. Early on, what also didn't go well was the marketing campaign for Spotted Cow. But Deb took on that challenge with her characteristic humor and tenacity. What she needed was a creative label design to match their whimsical name. Her genius was that this novel Farmer's Ale logo did not come off her computer, but rather from a simple magic marker. Maybe from reading my kids' nursery books or something, I just all of a sudden had the idea of a cow kind of jumping, and then of course there's space, so what's gonna be? Well, I guess I'll have them jumping over the state, and that's what I did. As the business slowly grew, Spotted Cow gradually increased in popularity, gaining momentum in the local marketplace. Deb continued to work nonstop, ultimately pushing the beer out of town to the second largest market. Chicago. But the Windy City and its often demanding, hard-edged business style did not sit well with Deb. Soon enough, she made a decisive marketing decision. To the shock of most in the industry, as quickly as Spotted Cow entered, the beer exited Chicago. I mean, I'm just done with it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the way they behave. I'm tired of driving down there. You know, the girls were younger then, so I'm trying to, like, get up at three in the morning and drive to Chicago and drive back at night and work the next day. It was exhausting. I'm, Screw it. We'll pull out of Illinois. That will give us, you know, the extra 15 or 20 percent that we need to take care of people in Wisconsin. And it, you know, it's not our goal to be big, so who cares? Holy man, you know, wholesalers called me. What are you thinking? You can't do this. Don't be thinking you're going to do this in six months. I'm going to take your brands back. You know, there was threats of lawsuits. They, you know, everybody was scratching their head. And I just felt like, well, the goal is to make good beer. It fits. And I haven't looked back. When she did it, there's a lot of chatter about what were they thinking because Chicago, I think, is the second biggest beer market in the country uh, as far as dollar sales. What, what were they thinking to reject Chicago? That's crazy. The concept was not new. It was in fact what Colorado's Coors famously did long ago, selling their beer only west of the Mississippi River. Nonetheless, it was a stunning development. Nuglera's beer would now only be sold in Wisconsin. To meet popular demand, a new facility, Hilltop, was constructed just south of the original warehouse on Highway 69. Quickly, it rose to the number two selling beer in the state behind only Miller Lite. And the company grew to be the 17th largest craft brewery in America. This is a world-class facility with world-class brewers in it. You guys should be proud of that. Spotted Cow's avid fan base spread to faraway places. In one case, all the way to the Mad River Grill on the Upper East Side in New York City. To satisfy these thirsty New York-based badgers, Mad River's proprietors imported not one, but 50 cases. This was, naturally, against licensing law. And on November 6, 2009, the authorities confiscated all that spotted cow in a raid. Back in New Glarus, surely it was inevitable. A prince came to fit Cinderella's slipper. Or rather, Deb received a phone call from Dan's former employer the little company known more familiarly as Anheuser-Busch. 
first time Anheuser-Busch called us, I thought they're nuts. Like, why on earth would you be calling me? The second time they called me, they had been putting together their groups of breweries, and I was like, this is not something I want. Deb kept saying she wasn't interested. The beer giant kept persisting. All of a sudden, I get a non-disclosure thing faxed to me, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You're going to come tour my brewery, and I'm not supposed to tell anybody about your tour of my brewery? Screw you. So I called my attorney, and I'm like, just send me you know, some non-disclosure thing. And I sent it right back to him, and I said, no problem, you're touring my brewery, you, f- you fill it out. Well, and then it's like, whoo, 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 whoo. No, we just want to come by, we just want to come by. And, I, and I'm like, this is getting fishier and fishier. Sure, come on by. They fly into Monroe to meet me, so take them through Riverside, jump in our vehicles, take them up to Hilltop, tour through Hilltop. They're still saying to me, is there a place we could sit down and have a meeting? And I'm like, I've toured you through both plants. Do you see an empty room? You guys are going to have to spit out what exactly you want. Well, we want a minority interest in the brewery. And I just was like, look, guys, this isn't interesting to me. You've got a brewmaster, I've got one. You've got uh, labs, I've got one. I've already got access to your national distribution system. That is nothing there for me. And 10 or 20% of the business, you can't get the Spotted Cow or the Belgian Red recipe out of me for that. So I'm not interested. I told you that. Now you've wasted both of our times. You know. So anyway, I'm like, okay. So we go down to the bottom of the brew hall. And they came like in February or something, but it's a huge dump of snow. The snow's like two feet deep. The parking lot's not plowed. They've got suits on, you know, those little slipper shoes. And we go down to the bottom of the brew hall and I open the door <laughs> to this huge parking lot of snow. And of course they walk out and <laughs> they walk out and they turn around. And they're like, aren't you coming with us? And I'm like, no, I told you I have to work. And I shut the door, <laughs> went back to work. And they out there meandering through the snow drifts. <laughs> it's kind of sad actually. <laughs> New Glarus turned down the largest brewer in the world. And then she did it again. Deb had already created a work paradise for her and her devoted employees. To become a small cog in a giant corporate machine simply was of no interest to her. Business boomed and sales increased 1,000% between 2000 and 2011. The outside world sufficiently fended off. Their local roots effectively turned on. The Carries currently find comfort in their version of small-town America. Every autumn, Deb and Dan take part in Oktoberfest in downtown New Glarus. A hearty tradition that demonstrates the intimate relationship they have constructed with the village and the people in this cherished place. We had a consistency of direction. We're going to go this way and come hell or high water. Every day, we're going to keep moving in the right direction. And if you do that day in and day out, you're going to get somewhere. But if you change directions all the time, or you say, you know what, I'll do it tomorrow, or I don't feel like doing it, or it's too much work, you can talk yourself into believing anything. You have to be honest with yourself. Uh, Like Oprah says, you got to live deliberately. It's not so easy. As Oprah might also say, or Ellen, or maybe even Barack Obama. What's next for Wisconsin's barrenness of beer? I'm not certain what my purpose will be in the end, because I don't feel, I feel like in a lot of ways I'm just beginning, but I know right now that I am supposed to be here and what I'm doing is good work. The thing that is important to me is I, and I feel it's a great honor. Every day I have the ability to impact somebody's life in a positive way. I don't know why this is making me cry. These people are important to me and I know what it's like to work and work hard and not be treated fairly. And life isn't fair. All around me, I have veterans and people who've lost spouses and 
There's courage in little places, and they have the grace to share their lives with us. And the decisions we make impact them. Then they can send their kids to school, they can buy a house, they can go on vacation. Those are the things that make a life bearable and rich and allow them to give to others. That's a great honor. What was important is, is in business is, is to take care of your employees. It turns the pyramid upside down. What I mean by that is, is that if, if, you're, if the health and well-being of your employees is number one, and that is paying them well, paying them a living wage, paying health insurance, trying your best to take care of them, which is not easy. If you do those things, they will trust you, they'll follow your lead, they'll make a good product in an efficient manner. Uh, you can sell that product because it's good at a profit and you'll make money. We have always worked and we didn't want to make our money on somebody else's back. It turns out to be that taking care of your people makes you successful. And I think a lot of businesses miss that point, that if you really do take care of your people, they show up on time, they work hard for you, they give extra energy to the job or extra thought, their families are supportive, you know, so they have a nicer home life. And all of those things are required to be successful in a very competitive world. I went from no job, not even making a first house payment, to I'm um, remarried, comfortable, happy. Took a chance of applying here and I got in. And since uh, I got great health insurance here, uh, I got a family, I got two boys now and my wife, where our medical bills are always paid. I wouldn't really consider my job is working for them as far as helping them. Never in my life have I had a job where uh, I worry about work when I'm at home, which isn't always healthy. I have, you know, a really good quality of life. I'm able to, you know, have a home and a nice vehicle and, you know, get to go take trips. It's a lot of fun. I definitely got way more interested in beer um, than I ever thought I would. The main thing I guess I like is uh, Obviously, it's owned by Dan and Deb Carey, and uh, I get to see them every day, and I get to talk to them every day. The growth that we're experiencing is a reflection of, of their personalities, and, uh, and it allows them to uh, be able to treat their employees well. I've always viewed Spotted Cow as being this very elegant ale that uh, is very European in its approach to flavor. So I tell people that uh, Dan brews the beer, Deb runs the company, and I do everything else. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, again, uh, we make beer. <laughs> I mean, life doesn't get much better than that. The carriers have survived pending poverty. They have faced ultimate business risks. They have beaten the odds. They have built a multi-million dollar company. Most impressively, they have achieved all this success on their own terms. St. Francis of Assisi once said, he who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. He who works with his hands, his head, and his heart is an artist. Nobody has ever caught the Cary Saints, but kindred spirits? If Francis had ever left Assisi, one hopes he would have wound up in New Glarus and had a beer. And the beer, a spotted cow. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the tale of the Spotted Cow. <laughs>